Our second presenter this afternoon is Lady Gillian Dean. In preparing this introduction, I quickly realised that Gillian is a woman with formidable energy. Her passions revolve around advocating for those with disabilities, rare disorders, working for the arts, genealogy, and her extraordinary garden, to my mind. As an aside, today, Gillian and Roderick are selling copies of their lovely book, A Guide to My Mind, the proceeds of which they are very generously donating to the Australian Garden History Society. You can purchase that at afternoon tea and it will also be uh, for sale again tomorrow as well. Gillian is the chair and founder of the Dean Endowment Trust. She is the patron of Intellectually Handicapped Children New Zealand. She was previously the trustee of the Arts Foundation of New Zealand, the International Festival of the Arts, the Diana Princess of Wales Trust, the New Zealand Organisation of Rare Disorders, the Centre for Clinical Research and Effective Practice, and patron of the Mary Potter Hospice in Wellington. As I said, a woman with formidable energy. This afternoon, Gillian is going to share with us her discovery of illustrator Sarah Phaeton and how she has used New Zealand plants in her own garden to create to my mind. Please join me in welcoming Gillian. Thank you, Bronwyn, for those kind words. Good afternoon to our patron, our president, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, Fiona, you've really given a wonderful history. I, I don't have to say anything about how wonderful natives are because they all believe you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'd like to talk about then and now and to introduce you to a 19th century botanic artist, Sarah Featon, who painted New Zealand flora. In doing so, she always had beside her Sir Joseph Hawker's Handbook of New Zealand Flora. And to Gillian Dean, who's loved New Zealand natives for as long as she can remember. Uh, once I knew I was part Māori, I could understand the depth of this intense emotion. The Australian Garden History Society is celebrating the explosion of botanical knowledge since Captain James Cook first landed 250 years ago in Gisborne on the east coast of New Zealand. By a happy coincidence, Sarah and I have both lived in Gisborne. 120 years after the initial collection of so many plants in the area, Sarah and Edward Featon were caught with botanical fever. They had eminent New Zealand botanists such as Professor Thomas Cook and more amateur botanists, but very well-read botanists such as Bishop William Colenso and Bishop William Williams sending specimens to them. Interesting, they also had a lot of nurserymen who sent specimens too. The former Governor Gray uh, was also on Edward's list and I found a letter um, to George Gray asking to send specimens from his Kawa Island. Sarah's paintings were featured in a 180 page book, an art album of New Zealand flora published in 1888. It was the first book published in New Zealand with colour illustrations. The cho chromolithographic process dramatised the colour of Sarah's delicate paintings. Chris Webb, who was the treasurer of the Royal New Zealand Horticulture Institute, lent me a copy of this album. It had been given to his great-grandfather in 1888 when he was Minister of Lands. I was captured by the beautiful detail of Sarah's paintings and spent the next four months researching her life and work. Edward and Sarah worked together on this challenging project. His florid Victorian prose gives an insight into how the Fetans felt about New Zealand plants. Edward 
rather similar letter, Fiona writes that the publication was based on scientific and systematic principles. He describes the great variety of New Zealand plants and mentions the luxuriant tropical nipa palm and the quaint cordyline or cabbage tree. Like me, Sarah was fortunate to have a husband who was so supportive of her passion for New Zealand flora. In the 1890s, the Fetons were living in Gisborne. And at that time, Bishop John Kinder painted the settlement of Gisborne, whoops, sorry, um, on the left. And he also walked throughout New Zealand and he came down near to our garden at Waikanae and there's a Maori Pa site at Waikanae painted by John Kinder about the same time. It's interesting to note on all the hills, the forest has disappeared. Writing about the land clearing practices of the 19th century, the eminent Canadian historian, distinguished professor John Weaver observed, by the 1920s, commercially popular species were becoming rare because of the exploitation uh, by the colonists. Predominant species met a wasteful exploitation. Notice this very careful historian uses this word twice in a sentence. The wasteful exploitation by crude land clearing onslaughts. Today, only 10% of the original wetlands remain, but resuscitation is occurring. Today, the Queen Elizabeth Trust has 84,000 hectares of native planting and wetlands protected by over 3,000 covenants with private landowners and farmer-held covenants. In our rural neighbourhood, we live on the remnants of a once vast Tihapu swamp. Many of our neighbours are planting native trees, revegetating old farm paddocks and restoring the swamp to give the wetland plants and the native birds an opportunity to flourish. Our road has a very high density of QE2 covenants to protect the wetlands and the precious native trees. As Fiona said, 80% of New Zealand flora is only found in New Zealand. Our garden is about 30 acres of a 90 acre property. So Roderick says, I still have another 60 acres to go. <laughs> Our dream of a New Zealand garden began from looking at the shape of the dunes and the wetlands. With appropriate resource consents and some advice from experts, we removed the weed infestation from the wetlands, planted tens of thousands of native trees and shrubs. In pursuit of the Beaton's love of native flora and their wish that New Zealand natives be fully appreciated, we've planted art and restored about 30 acres so far. Many of our neighbours have done the same. If we had known about the extent of the challenges, would we have been so enthusiastic about the venture? I did give Roderick a pair of gumboots when he retired from being a chief executive and he looked so they weren't the nicest gift he's ever got, but gosh, he wears them every day now. <laughs> We've had to cope with dry, sandy soil, fierce coastal winds, no shelter initially, severe frosts, a lack of rain in summer, and too many hungry rabbits and pukekos. The pictures of Roderick and me in the very early days. I think Sarah and Edward would be reassured by the impact of their wonderful book on so many gardeners. So I have used some of Sarah's most dramatic paintings of flowers, which signal a new season. The Kofi holds a special place in New Zealanders' hearts. Sarah's painting on the left, whoops, sorry, I've done it again. <laughs> oh. Sarah's painting on the left, are Kofi on the right, and Pahutakawa tree, Sarah's painting on the left, 
Julian's photograph on the right, but look at the detail of Sarah's, the Hutakawa Brecht's. They're absolutely beautiful. Roderick's favourite tree is the Kahikatea, and their search for plants for the use for economic reasons, which Tim talked about this morning. Early sailors thought their straight trunks would make good masts, however their wood was too soft. Sarah's painting of the Kahikatea cones is beautiful. These tiny little cones that become these dramatic trees, it's an amazing, um, amazing sight. Um, their leaves give a fine lacy effect and the birds love those small red cones. Totra is probably one tree that you've all heard about. And for the Maori, Totra is symbol, a symbol of a great chief. Its trunks are lighter than Kari, so they're used for waka, that's canoes. Some uh, Totras grow to 30 to 40 meters in height. It is said that a Totra should be 150 to 200 years old if you wish to use its antimicrobial properties. A partly dug out waka armour was found in our eastern swamp. It resides in a storeroom at Te Papa. A waka armour is an archwicker canoe. Its discovery in 1964 was further evidence of the active use of the waterways running through our property. Manuka honey is, has been an important export for both Australia and New Zealand. It's well known now, worldwide. We have a large Manuka swamp and beehives on our property. Our beekeeper said he was going to give everyone um, a little jar of our honey to take home, but we explained you wouldn't be able to take it through customs. <laughs> Sarah's painting is on the left and our Manuka flowers on the right. I understand Australia has over 80 leptospermum varieties of Monica, and New Zealand only has two. I fear you're always grander than us. <laughs> Coromico is one of the Veronica family, as the Hebes have recently been renamed. Um, it has an exquisite flower head, which the bees loved. Maori's used it for many ailments, Sarah's painting in the top and my Coromico on the bottom right. Kawa Kawa tea is now frightfully fashionable. Maori have used the leaves for centuries for their anti-inflammatory problems and you heard for mourning and special ceremonies. Since the drought we experienced two summers ago, Kawakawa self-seeded prolifically in the garden. They're creating a charming undergrowth for some of our structured plantings. Once I probably would have taken them out. Now I say grow. <laughs> Far is an example of one of the translocation studies which Te Papa has been working on. Māori used its balsa-like wood for floats. The other species being studied by Laura Shepherd's team are Renga Renga, Kareka, and Coastal Kofi. Sarah's painting is on the left and Afa on the right. The flowers are just coming out at the moment. I've searched through Sarah's paintings at Te Papa and the National Library for a, a, a painting of flax flowers, but I haven't found one. And I can't imagine with all the flax in Gisborne at that time that she wouldn't have painted one. In early summer, the flax heads grow quickly and grace the landscape. Our native tuis stand precariously on them, and in an hour or two, they fall off quite drunk from the nectar. Maori gardens, had different varieties of flax for different purposes. Thinking about history, it's interesting that the whakapapa, or genealogy patterns, were woven in the flax on the, uh, in the marae, uh, marais. And so 
with being a non-written language, um, these memories of, of, um, of previous genealogies were all uh, on the flax in the meeting house, as well as all the other things. They used it for clothing and rope and um, you name it, they'd use flax. I read the other day that Lord Rutherford's father was taking some flax to the mill when he learnt that his son had won the Nobel Prize in physics. I'd now like to take you for a walk to some of the different parts of our garden to show you some of our native trees. Many of the walkways are lined with different species. The pictures show some of the walkways. We've got rather a lot, and they're one of my favourite parts of the garden. It was a pleasure to see some of you visit us on Wednesday, and we look forward to seeing more of you next Thursday. From the air, our large Manuka swamp is shaped like a kiwi. The kiwi shape is formed by a natural moat around the island. This is where the Waka Ama was discovered in 1964. Wikipedia says it's one of two Waka Amas found in New Zealand. The Waka Ama is a Maori canoe with art riggers. This is our Labrador's favourite swamp. The carrot sector has reclaimed its original swamp land. We have enjoyed its vigour. After going on a tour of some of Piet Ordorff's gardens in the Netherlands, our carracks felt as though they'd make great additions to his gardens. Since fencing off the wetlands and banning the cows from these areas, the carracks have made a wonderful recovery, as you can see from this sample. When we purchased the property, the cows had eaten most of the carracks. Now it's prolific, and a lot of it is self-sown. Azola, with its tiny fern-like leaves, abounds in the summer on the ponds and the lakes. Its relatives are used in the paddy fields in Asia to grow with rice because of their nitrogenous fixing qualities. I thought I must find out more about our Azola's nitrogenous fixing qualities. <coughs> Forium tenax, or flax, has reclaimed its rightful place in the sedge swamp. The flowers come in various colour. Māori's use this amazing plant for medicine, clothing and ropes. We have a few sculpture in the garden, and I thought I'd show you Ralph Hotery, who some of you might know, a stained glass window. He was sitting at my table at lunch, and he said, I, I've got a window under my bed and I, I think it, he lives in Dunedin, uh, and he said, I think it would be perfect there. It even looks like Kapiti. Uh, and so it does look perfect there, and we think of dear Ralph. The Mai Mai um, were used by um, shooters the night before the duck shooting season. There were three, and we've kept two of them. And oh, the property is called Te Mai Mai. Mai Mai also means a token of affection, and Roderick gave me the land for my 50th birthday, so I thought it was rather a nice name. And this is a Rick Rudd stone sculpture made of a raku, and it looks rather like Stonehenge, I think. Um, the feather sphere seems to be everyone's favourite sculpture. It's suspended over a large gully of native trees. It looks rather like a, a lowland forest now. Um, it comprises of 15 feathers representing 16, 16 feathers representing 16 native birds which frequent our garden. It was created by Neil Dawson. He created those feathers for the Olympic Games, and I think in Melbourne you've got one of his sculptures. Um, Australia seems to like him just about as much as we do. This is my favourite garden in spring. Here are the Kofi and the Golden Tainui. When I first opened the book that Chris lent me, it opened at the page of the Golden Tainui. 
Um, it's just absolutely amazing in spring. And although it had been in his, Chris's family for so long, the glass scene that um, was over the um, painting had never been lifted. So I rang the National Library and they said, you put a piece of A4 paper between the glass scene. And that same, so, they, so here it was for the first time since 18, 88 um, on show, and it, it, it's one of my favourite plants too. This is Roderick's favourite summer garden flower, the Pahutakawa, otherwise known as the New Zealand Christmas tree, because it begins to flower about the week before Christmas and goes through to about the 11th of January. We've also got red and yellow and orange flowering ones and they're very handy, hardy and thrive in our coastal environment. Uh, we're very worried about the myrtle rust because we can't imagine what New Zealand would look like without the Pahutakawa and the Manuka. Our Labradors think the garden and particularly the wetlands was created for them. It's a paradise for them and they keep us well exercised. A major attraction in purchasing the property, and I think the people who came on Wednesday all commented, is the, the amazing views towards Kapiti Island. We see, um, on, a, uh, on a good day, we can see Mount Taranaki in the north, um, Kapiti in the west, and to the south, the Kaikouras. And every night, just about, we get a splendid sunset and uh, it's just so different and you just linger until the sun goes right down. It's going over to the south side of the island now. Oh, Kapiti is one of um, New Zealand's most important bird sanctuaries. So we see flocks of birds going back at night to roost in Kapiti. So back to then and now. Um, the bare cow paddocks with its sand and peat. The wetlands were filled in for farming or weed infested. So what has happened to this cow paddock? Let me take you on a walk. The Japanese call it forest bathing. I'm sorry that Edward and Sarah can't join us. And I'm sorry, Fiona, that you aren't going to join us either because I think you might quite like it. <laughs> <laughs> We began with the inner garden near to the house. We created a picnic area, because I love picnics, surrounded by the resilient Akiak, which withstood the wind. The spiky corduline, or Maoris call it tea, and settlers called it cabbage trees, make their own sculptural patterns. The inner garden also has puka, nikau, hebe speciosa, pahutakawa, ringa ringa, punga, flax, brachyglottis and others. Although our inner garden feels private, the view reaches out to the sea and Kapiti Island is just wonderful to look at. The in-between garden takes us to the east, north, south and west of the property. I had early walkways surveyed to protect us from the wind, because I don't think you've had very much yet since you've been here, but Wellington winds are fierce. And we've planted natives intensively, and they now protect each other. The vigour of some of the trees is astonishing. It's well south for Kauris, but some Kauri pollen was found in a cutting on um, the State Highway 48, so we know that once they lived in our area. Ours have done splendidly, and they're now very large trees. Many of our larger native trees are on the boundary of the outer garden. It gives us joy to watch them grow. I think this spring, some of them, some of the totra have grown about eight inches already. When I look at this overhead, I can hardly believe that we started just 25 years ago. And I said to Lynn, well, 25 years ago isn't very long for the 
your prestigious garden society. But um, by bringing Sarah into it, I was able to weave some history in as well. Much of the original forest would have been Totra, and I'd imagined the huge and now extinct moa foraging. However, an eminent archaeologist told me that moa would have been bogged in the swamp. So it was a lovely daydream. The wetlands have a magical quality with the reflection of light and the shimmering water. The birds fly over them looking for insects and little dab chicks, their grebes, uh, ride on their parents' backs for the few months after they're hatched. Ducks and frogs abound. Bridges link the various islands in the wetlands and the water levels vary significantly season by season in response to highly variable rainfalls. From reading between the lines, I suspect Edward Featon liked to have the last word. And this uh, is one of his sentences, which I think is quite perfect for him to have one of the last words. There is no reason whatever that our own native plants should not be as much esteemed and cultivated, for they are equally as suitable for garden purposes and quite as ornamental. And thank you for allowing me to show some of Sarah's paintings alongside our native plants. I hope you understand the affinity I felt with Sarah's work when I looked at her paintings and read Edward's comments. What is so wonderful today is the number of people who have captured their spirit and who are restoring wetlands around New Zealand. I think Sarah and Edward would have been delighted. And finally, I'll mention that Te Papa have a, an exhibition of some of Sarah's watercolours on the fifth floor. If you go to the lift behind the theatre and go up to the fifth floor, the paintings, there's about 10 of them, are straight up the lift door, and I'd love you to go and see them. So thank you very much. Yes, if I can, <laughs> if I know the answer. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll get to you any chance. Does anybody have any questions yeah. they'd like to ask? No, you see, they'd like afternoon tea. They may. Yes. Oh, I'll ask a question. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, what do you reckon your losses were when you were planted? Mm. Oh, initially, um, <laughs> Sometimes uh, there were moratoriums on me. You can't plant anything there for the third time. Oh. <laughs> but we did, and they made it. Um, then I started using frost guard, that silicon, um, and sprayed the back of the leaves. And that gave us another two degrees um, that we could save from the frost. And then once there are more plants, they look after each other and talk to each other. Um, there was a painting in the Van Gogh Museum that we saw recently, and all these trees, their roots were interwoven, and they looked gnarled, and as though they'd had long, hard lives. And we were with a friend who was a psychiatrist, and he said, he was tortured, wasn't he? And I said, no, he just knew all about the trees sharing the food from their roots before anyone else did. <laughs> Um, I, I was part of the pre-conference uh, tour group that had the privilege of coming and looking at Tamawe. And um, it, it's very um, interesting how close it is to the ocean. And um, we talked to you about the difficulty of growing a garden essentially in some very difficult soil, or perhaps it wasn't even a soil. Did it's you want to talk a little years. bit about that, mm, that process? Um, it was once we started using water and mulch, it made a, a big difference. But those Akiaks are just so strong and resilient. And I'd taken them for granted for 15 years. And not long ago, um, botanists from the regional council came to visit and said they loved my Akiak 
forest. And I thought, I've forgotten about you, my little treasures, for 15 years. Um, you know, you just did your work. So I've been planting a lot more on other high parts of the property. And, you know, they're doing so well, but I feel guilty that I'd forgotten. <laughs> I'd taken them for granted. But some of the parts, um, you know, sort of like the Kofi that died and the... Uh, and the um, the poor Pahutukawas that got frostbitten when they were too young. But the other interesting thing, Fiona, is once I started using smaller plants that hadn't been spoilt at the nursery by being watered to um, two or three times a day, um, that made a big difference because they were more resilient to take our harsh climate. even going to be less then, it's got to look after that with no roots. It's got to grow all those roots yet before it can even sustain the top. So harsh the environment. You go 10 years later, plant a metre tree, plant one 10, 20 centimetres tall, you will find which is the healthier tree and the smaller And they're one both the same tree. size. Yes. I mean, that's a fascinating thing. Gillian, thank you. And Roderick, who some of you may not realise is also with us today, for sharing not only to my mind, but also for speaking with us in your journey. Thank you. Thank you, Roderick.